This is the story of the House of Love and Terror, the peaceful home in the Hollywood Hills where the rich and famous once found sanctuary, but where actress Sharon Tate and four others were savagely murdered in the summer of 1969 by members of the Manson family. Benedict Canyon lies in a ravine at the crest of the Santa Monica Mountains. Formed of volcanic rock thousands of years ago, Benedict Canyon has an ecosystem much like the Mediterranean. The salty water air from the Pacific breezes in via Santa Monica and results in a humid canyon base filled with chaparral and evergreens. Where the sun hits hardest, the slopes of the canyon, is instead ripe with oaks, eucalyptus, and wild grasses. In the mid-1800s, this region, along with most of Beverly Hills, was known as Rancho de la Aguas, Ranch of the Waters. In 1852, a grant for Rancho de la Aguas was filed with the Public Land Commission by Maria Rita Quinteros Valdez de Villa, granddaughter of one of the first settlers of the Mission de los Angeles. In 1868, she sold some of the acreage at Rancho de la Aguas to Edson A. Benedict, a beekeeper and shop owner who moved to California from Missouri. The canyon was named for Edson Benedict, considered its founding father. During the earliest days of Rancho de la Aguas, grizzly bears roamed the hillside, but they were snuffed out by big game hunters in the late 1800s. Yet there are 18 different species of snakes that inhabit the canyon. Only the rattlesnake is venomous among them. With the development of Greater Los Angeles during the late 1800s and the film industry in the early 1900s, so too did Benedict Canyon grow. Roads were quickly built, leading from urban areas into the canyon. Yet the ravine and topography have always made Benedict Canyon a respite from the outside world, a place where the powerful could isolate themselves. Many of Hollywood's earliest stars chose Benedict Canyon as their homes, including silent screen heartthrob Rudolph Valentino. In 1925, Valentino built a palatial Spanish colonial revival mansion on a four-acre property in the canyon which he called Falcon Lair. His 4,700-square-foot home was located on Bella Drive, just east of Cielo Drive. Valentino died only a year after Falcon Lair was completed, and the property was auctioned off to pay the actor's many debts. Falcon Lair was later sold in the early 50s to heiress Doris Duke. Other film stars who lived in Benedict Canyon included Charlie Chaplin on Summit Drive, and John Barrymore on Tower Lane. In 1940, French actress Michelle Morgan came to America seeking refuge during World War II from the Nazi occupation. Morgan appeared in several box office hits in France before the war, and once in Hollywood, she was contracted to RKO Pictures, gained U.S. citizenship, and attempted to make it as an American film star. In 1941, Morgan bought the property then listed as 10050 Cielo Drive and commissioned renowned designer Robert Byrd to create a home at the property inspired by the French countryside. Sitting on 3.3 acres of prime Benedict Canyon real estate, the main property at 10050 de Cielo Drive was a 3,200-square-foot house designed to resemble a 19th-century French cottage. It was a typical California indoor-outdoor home of that era, typified by beamed ceilings, Dutch doors, and rustic details. The living room featured a stone fireplace and half-loft. There was a swimming pool and guest house just past the master bedroom, plus a wishing well and charming woodland garden. Plus, there was a multi-vehicle garage between the main house and front drive. 
10050 sat at the end of a cul-de-sac, bordered by thick pines and flowering cherry trees. It was the kind of lush California canyon terrain where you could look out but few of your neighbors could see in. 10050 and its neighboring property, 10048, were both designed by Bird, built at the same time, and referred to as twin houses, similar in design although not identical. They sat on a plateau in Benedict Canyon known as the Bedroom Properties. 10048 was purchased by Harold Lamb, an author and screenwriter, for $20,000 and Michelle Morgan paid $32,000 for her property at 10050. Michelle Morgan liked to climb the living room loft and paint landscape pictures using the view as inspiration. In one publicity picture, the actress sits in an upstairs window, accessible from the loft, looking out at her scenic Hollywood vista. In 1942, Morgan married band leader William Marshall, and they had a son, Mike, in 1944. But not all of their memories at 10050 were pleasant. Rumor has it that Michelle considered the property haunted, specifically the living room. She was also unsuccessful at achieving the level of success she had previously experienced in France, despite several leading roles. She was even considered for the female lead in Casablanca, which inevitably went instead to Ingrid Bergman. In 1945, with the war in Europe over, the Morgan Marshall family departed California and returned to Europe, where the actress continued with her career. The property was then sold to Dr. Hartley Dewey. Socialites Hartley and his wife Louise were good friends with Walt Disney, often vacationing with the famed illustrator. The doctor and his family only lived at Cielo Drive occasionally. Most of the time, they rented it out, often to actors. In 1946, it was rented to film star Lillian Gish. Gish, who was then filming Duel in the Sun, lived at the property with her mother. In 1963, Dr. Dewey sold Cielo Drive to talent manager Rudolf Rudy Altabelli for $86,000. Altabelli was an openly gay man at a time when that was not socially acceptable. Yet in Hollywood, he found a culture that accepted him and allowed his career to thrive. Altabelli frequently traveled for work to Europe, and when he was overseas, he rented out the main house. If he happened to return while the home was still leased, he would live in the guest house or have friends stay there as caretakers for the property. Altabelli owned three dogs, two poodles and a Weimaraner. The talent manager kenneled his dogs at the property and often paid caretakers to watch after them while he traveled. Rudy rented Cielo to several tenants between 1963 and 1969. His most famous renters included Henry Fonda and newlyweds Cary Grant and Diane Cannon, who honeymooned at Cielo Drive following their July 1965 wedding. In May of 1966, Altabelli rented the house to music producer Terry Melcher. Melcher, the son of movie star Doris Day, was a producer for Columbia Records. He had taken local bands The Birds and Paul Revere and the Raiders and turned them into megastars. He began this journey when he was just 23 and went on to produce more than 80 hit songs for Columbia. Terry leased 10050 Cielo along with talent manager Roger Hart. Later, when Hart moved out, singer Mark Lindsay of Paul Revere and the Raiders, a good friend of Melcher's, became Terry's second roommate. Lindsay was at least the second resident of Cielo Drive to claim that the house was haunted, years before Sharon Tate and her friends were murdered there.
Mark also recounted times when the sound system would inexplicably turn itself on, sometimes in the middle of the night when the occupants were sleeping. He claimed that Terry started taking downers during the day, not just at night to sleep, and he himself put a 44 Magnum under his pillow each night. Lindsay also explained that after he lived at Cielo for around a month, Rudy Altabelli told him and Terry that the home was haunted by a woman who killed herself in the house after learning that her husband had cheated on her. He told Mark and Terry to watch out for the spirit of the jealous woman. By late 1967, Terry Melcher was dating Candace Bergen, the daughter of famed ventriloquist Edgar Bergen. During the mid-1960s, Candace enjoyed a successful career as a fashion model, and by 66, she had parlayed that success into work as a film actor. As the relationship between the producer and Starlet progressed, and Candace spent more and more time at Cielo Drive, Mark Lindsay noticed that strange events happened in the home when Bergen was there, leaving the singer to wonder if the spirit of the femme fatale was trying to chase the pretty young blonde away. He also kept walking in on Melcher and Candace canoodling on the living room sofa, so when it became apparent that Candace would be staying indefinitely, Mark moved out. But before he did, sometime in 1968, he once found a strange, short, dark-haired man sitting on the kitchen floor. Charles Manson was introduced to Terry Melcher in the spring or summer of 1968 by Beach Boys drummer Dennis Wilson. Charlie and many other members of his so-called family were encamped at Wilson's Sunset Boulevard property on and off that year. Wilson enjoyed Manson's lyrics and his canny wisdom and had vowed to help the ex-con find success in the music industry. Melcher, Wilson, and talent scout Greg Jacobson, collectively, were often known as the Golden Penetrators for their sexual proclivities during that era. Charlie's girls had been well-trained by the former pimp to please anyone with power and means to provide for the pint-sized guru. All of the women were instructed to make themselves available to Wilson and his friends. Charlie made sure to include Melcher in the orgies in hopes of securing a record deal. Charlie had both Wilson and Jacobson eating out of the palm of his hand, but Terry Melcher proved elusive. He might indulge in a little hanky-panky with the girls, but he was aloof and reserved. Terry knew that he was a hot ticket and wanted to preserve his reputation by working with only the best. And as the son of a well-known actress, he also recognized the kind of sycophants that gravitated to people like him. Melcher would visit Dennis's pad and have some fun with Charlie and the women, but he never seemed to have time to listen to Manson perform. Terry and Candace's relationship was not always perfect. Melcher was often unfaithful, including with some of Charlie's gals. But their life at Cielo Drive befitted these children of the stars. As Bergen later remembered, Lynette Squeaky Fromm, in her 2018 book Reflection, derisively wrote, In fact, the couple shared Cielo Drive with Bergen's pet Peruvian kinkajou and Melcher's 14 cats. Charlie was hopeful that his relationship with the Golden Penetrators would pay off for him. 
Dennis Wilson invited Charlie and the family to perform in the Beach Boys' private studio and introduced him to Neil Young, Frank Zappa, and other music stars. And on at least five occasions, Manson tagged along with Dennis and Greg on their way to Melcher's home at 10050 Cielo Drive. The man who could fulfill his dreams, Charlie knew, lived in that luxury hillside home. As the family grew, Charlie began looking for another home. They departed Wilson's for Spawn Ranch, a derelict property in Chatsworth and former Western film set. Owner George Spawn was 79 years old, blind, and in debt to the IRS after Hollywood gave up on big picture westerns in the early 1960s. Reduced to selling pony rides to earn money, Spawn allowed the family to stay at his property in exchange for help around the place. Charlie encouraged Lynette Fromm to keep a watchful eye on old George. By October 1968, after the birth of Susan Atkins' son, Charlie decided to leave Spawn Ranch for Death Valley, where the family lived at two meager desert properties. They returned to the Los Angeles area in November after Charlie had a vision of achieving fame and fortune with his music career. He came back to some sour news, however. Greg Jacobson had just been arrested on a minor drug possession charge. Charlie offered to help bail the talents got out, but he was broke. So he sent his follower, Charles Tex Watson, to Terry Melcher's house to borrow money for Jacobson's bail. Watson hitched down to Benedict Canyon, and when he arrived at Cielo Drive, was led by Melcher's maid into the kitchen and told to wait while she found her employer. While Tex was waiting, Melcher's girlfriend Candace Bergen came into the kitchen. By Bergen's behavior, Watson knew she didn't care for the looks of him. Once Melcher showed up, he gave Tex one of his cars, a Jaguar, so Tex could pick Jacobson up at jail. He also loaned him his standard oil card for gas. You have to wonder about those moments he spent in Melcher's house. This is, after all, the same house that Tex Watson later sliced into through a screen window and then butchered everyone inside. Looking back, the fancy maid, the elite vehicles at the producer's disposal, the hot blonde starlet in her snooty attitude, if you don't have the same privileges, you're bound to grow resentful. Reminders of the wealth and privilege that others around them enjoyed, Charlie and the family began to resent those that they saw as the establishment, or piggies. The word piggies was inspired by a song on the Beatles' White Album, released in late 1968. They were eating food out of dumpsters, while others had everything at their disposal. Charlie also began to talk about Helter Skelter, a race war that he believed was imminent. He told his family that they would survive a violent racial apocalypse by fleeing back to Death Valley and waiting out the war in which most whites would be slaughtered and black people would be the victors. That season, the family began to drive around the greater Los Angeles area looking for cars and other valuables to steal. They started breaking into middle-class homes in the dead of night, a macabre form of theater which they called creepy crawling, moving furniture around, sometimes taking small trinkets and food, stealthily and silently, never leaving enough evidence of their crimes that homeowners called police. As the world closed in on them in 1969, the family became more desperate, more drug-addicted, and more bitter toward anyone in better positions than them. The end of 1968 had also brought trouble for Terry Melcher. His relationship with Candace Bergen was not going well, and Melcher had another personal crisis. His mother was broke. Doris Day discovered her late husband, Melcher's stepdad, had embezzled from her accounts. She was on the verge of ruin and needed someone to manage her career and salvage her finances. Terry successfully stepped in 
and negotiated a sweet contract for a television variety show that would run four years. Melcher moved out of Cielo Drive in January 1969. He moved to a new rental home on the beach, and he and Candace dissolved their relationship. Within a few weeks, Rudy Altabelli found his new renters. They were a young married couple expecting a baby. He was a famed European film director, and she was a beautiful and glamorous movie star. They would be moving to Cielo Drive the following month. Viewers, part two of Cielo Drive, The House of Love and Terror, will be airing in just a couple short months. In the meantime, make sure that you are subscribed to this channel so that you can see all of the Manson family content you're looking for.